The, the first community of those who followed Yeshua, Jesus, the, the Messiah, were all Jews. Yeshua was a Jew. And this Jewish Messiah is also descended from Abraham, the Jewish patriarch. And he was prophesied in Jewish scriptures, penned by Jewish prophets in a Jewish family book, which we know as the Bible. He came as foretold in Jewish covenants. He was cut and he ratified the new covenant with his Jewish blood. He died and he rose from the dead to save not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. At a certain point in time, Gentiles began to be added to this Jewish movement. There were enough to beg the question, what do we do with the Gentiles who are now believing or want to follow Jesus as their Messiah and Savior? First of all, they're not circumcised. Secondly, they don't know anything about the Torah. And thirdly, we can't eat with them. We couldn't pray with Gentiles. We couldn't worship God with Gentiles. And Messianic Judaism was no different. It was all a Jewish thing. first Jerusalem Council, it was a, a reaction um, of uh, Jewish believers who were shocked what the Holy Spirit is doing. Always when the Holy Spirit is acting beyond our box of thinking, beyond our theology, beyond our uh, understanding of the world, then we are shocked or surprised. And uh, you, you must imagine that in the, uh, after, after Jesus died and he went to the heaven, he said, I, I will send you a Holy Spirit, but nobody was expecting what it will be. And it was a first surprise what they experienced it in Acts chapter two, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And they were happy. They created a Messianic congregation in Jerusalem. And suddenly the Holy Spirit was surprising them second time and uh, it was an uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Samaria. And they were really shocked because, you know, we are Jewish people. They, Samaritans, were Jews, but not 100% correct Jews. They didn't have the same theology as we have as, as a Jews. So they are sending the best man, John and Peter, to really check if this is really for Holy Spirit or not. And they are surprised and saying, yeah, this is it the same outpouring of the Holy Spirit, so it's from God. And they had to increase their understanding and, and the hearts. And then comes the third surprise, which is Cornelius. Apostle Peter, uh, as described in, in Acts 10, goes, led by the Spirit, is made aware that there's this Roman centurion named Cornelius, who, who's a Gentile, who's described as a God-fearer who as a God-fearer has an essential understanding of and, and an attraction to monotheism that's practiced by, by the Jews. And probably to some of the moral quality that's described as part of, of Jewish life. And this God-fearer uh, has a hunger for more, but it was a big step culturally to move past how do I then meet with these unclean Gentiles who do not live a life, do not practice what God has revealed in his word as his righteous purposes for the blessing of all humanity. 
And so the apostle Peter wrestles with that. And God drops in this vision, this sheet full of unclean animals. And it takes several times for Peter to realize that God is saying, I've put all this unclean into something that I want to do something about. And it can't be done if you're separate from them. You've got to be willing to trust the expansion of the reality of the victory won by Jesus, Yeshua, in his resurrection, the new life, the abundant life for all humanity. Uh, we're told in the book of Acts, an, an angel came to Cornelius's house and instructed him to contact Peter, one of Yeshua's Jewish followers. Even though Cornelius is a Gentile, he's with his family, he's with friends, Peter is able to come into the house because he had been given a vision from God in which God communicated to Peter that it was okay, it was all right for him to have this level of interaction with, with a Gentile. Peter comes to Cornelius's house. He communicates to them that he typically doesn't do this, that it's generally taboo for a Jewish person to come into a, a Gentile person's home. And so Peter then proceeds to share with Cornelius and with his household and with his friends about who Yeshua is. He, he talks about Yeshua's death, his resurrection, and as Peter is sharing these things, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is poured down upon the Gentiles. They receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is the first example that we have of Gentiles coming into this movement. And the fourth surprise came when the Holy Spirit was um, poured out for, on total pagans, on total Gentiles in Antioch, who were not worshiping of God of Israel. When that happens, the Jerusalem congregation sends Barnabas to Antioch to try to investigate and see what, you know, what happened. Barnabas looks into it. What he finds is, in fact, yes, there are all these Gentiles who've become followers of Yeshua. At that point, what we're told is that, so he goes to Tarsus, he finds Paul, he brings Paul back to Antioch, and then we have uh, Barnabas and Paul discipling these Gentile believers. It's important to remember that in the Gentile world, the Roman Empire world, words like Lord, words like Savior were used of Caesar, of the empire. You've got this reality that these Gentiles have not, are not adding Yeshua to one more God in their pantheon they've recognized there's only one God. The monotheism of Israel, or Judaism, is now attracting this, the Gentile world, this freedom from the fear of death, this freedom from the dominion of sin, this reality that the kingdoms of this world in, in, in their oppressive nature, that they are not the kingdom that will last forever. There was a thriving congregation in Antioch, but people had come down from Judea who began to teach these new believers, you must be circumcised to be saved. Well, the first Jerusalem council, as it's usually known in church history, is the one where the apostles and elders gathered in Acts chapter 15 to ask a very big question. And that is when Gentiles come to faith in Yeshua, how are they to live? Are they called to take upon themselves Jewish biblical life, Torah life, to be circumcised and to live out the Torah just like Jews do? Saul, Apostle Paul, Barnabas, others believed this was not correct to put this on the Gentiles. So with the leadership's blessing, they went from Antioch to Jerusalem and submitted this to the the apostles, the apostles in Jerusalem, and said, is this correct? Paul and Barnabas and, and some others took this question up to Jerusalem and asked the question and a great debate arose. The, the Jewish community, the leadership in Jerusalem made up of the, some of the original apostles. They've got to make a decision. What do we do with these Gentiles 
who have accepted that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel, and more importantly, that he is the Lord of the cosmos. He's the savior of the world. God has chosen to provide salvation to the Gentiles without circumcision. So how is it that we now would ask them to be circumcised after they've already received their salvation? Not only in Antioch, but in the, all these other cities where Gentile believers are coming uh, to follow Yeshua, what, what should we expect of them in this new movement? And perhaps even in the generations to come, perhaps they thought this ruling would have great implications uh, for many, many people. So it's not a small question, by the way, because you don't want to create two different bodies of the Messiah. What was desired was that we would be able to maintain one body of the Messiah where Jews and Gentiles could be together, but there were certain issues that had to be faced head on. The Pharisee Messianic Jews uh, introduced their arguments that the Gentiles need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Peter communicates that um, the Holy Spirit has been given to these people and their hearts have been purified through faith. Paul and Barnabas communicate that signs and wonders and miracles have been done through their ministry to the Gentiles, and that all of this is a reflection of God having accepted the Gentiles as Gentiles. And then finally, Yaakov, James, the brother of Yeshua, weighs in after listening to, to both sides. And he delivered the consensus. I don't believe that he had the authority to absolutely make the decision alone, but he delivered the word of the consensus, which was that Gentiles were released from the distinctively Jewish uh, commitments in the law. This was showing a distinction between what we call today in theology, Jewish specific law over against the universal laws, which are for everybody. And that Gentiles are not responsible for Jewish specific law. This was a, an amazing council that had tremendous ramifications. However, it says that if a Gentile wants to learn Torah, it's taught in the synagogue every Shabbat. But there's no obligation to go to the synagogue, but there may be a hunger for it. So there's no requirement for circumcision. But I have found personally that if someone accepts Yeshua, who's not Jewish, and they walk with him and understand that their identity is completely in the Messiah and their salvation is completely found in Yeshua's finished work on the cross, his death and his resurrection, that that is a satisfactory place to be. But there are some Gentiles who want to learn more about Torah, want to learn a little bit more about what Jewish people think in terms of scripture, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and relationship with God. I, there's no prohibition against that. But then they get them a very specific instructions what to avoid themselves from, and um, and thus are re relieving the Gentiles to be who they are without putting extra weight on their shoulders. And after much prayer and deliberation and discussion, the apostles rendered a decision. We're only gonna put four laws, if you will, upon the Gentiles, and, uh, but they're free to worship and love, love the Lord within their own context, within their own culture. He says, uh, let us require them not to sacrifice food to idols. They should not eat blood. They should not eat the meat of strangled animals, and they should not participate in sexual immorality. It could very well be that Yaakov was saying, let us require them to cut off all ties with idolatry at a, at a very bare minimum in order for them to be received into the people of God as followers of Yeshua. Yeah, I think when we look at the four abstentions that the, the apostles lined out for the Gentiles, when you really take a look at what those, the, the importance of what those were, is they, were, they all had to do with social life. I think the church fathers and the first, you know, believing leaders, Jewish believers saw that so much, so much of this had to get worked out in relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, it seemed right to us in the Holy Spirit. We don't have a full picture of how this is all supposed to work, but we feel that this is where we want to start. And the way we want to start is we want to pave the way 
to have free and clear, healthy social fellowship with one another. And if we can create and we can all agree to these four things, then we can be in fellowship with one another without violating the lifestyle of the other. How do we have fellowship together? How do we, how do we affirm the reality of all of us together? I don't think the Apostle Paul ever viewed that the church was meant to be Gentiles and Jews and basically two separate churches, like Jesus has two different bodies. There is one body. And, and we all have a purpose in that. A letter is written in which uh, these four areas are mentioned. It's notable that the letter is written to the Gentile believers. Paul and Barnabas are, are tasked to bring this letter back to Antioch and to other cities in which the Gentile believers needed to be told who was, who was correct, the Pharisee Messianic Jews or Paul and Barnabas and, and how they understood uh, what God expected of the Gentile believers. When this, the, when this letter went out, when this news went out, the gospel began to spread greatly. When you read down after they make the decision, they said they took the letter, they took it to the churches and it was read aloud. And it says in there, there was great joy among all who heard. And um, you know that, <laughs> because I feel like it was like God was validating who they were. And he was not telling them that they needed to be anyone other than who they were to receive his love through Yeshua and to receive his Holy Spirit. It's really releasing them to, um, to walk as believers, uh, following Yeshua without trying to uh, impose on them uh, all the laws and which gives uh, freedom for people uh, to serve the Lord uh, within their culture and their society. Gentile followers of Yeshua were affirmed in their ethnic and national identities. And this was not something that was to be abandoned after becoming followers of Yeshua. God forbid if they didn't have this, this uh, wise decision and recommendation to the, to the nations, um, I don't know how, how much successful uh, the gospel would have gone to the nations. And that's basically allowing the people to be who they are, but coming to salvation as they are. If you're a man or woman, doesn't matter. Whatever culture and nationality you come from, uh, uh, it, it gives you the freedom to come to salvation and, and be a better person and influence your society. And I thank God that they made this decision because it gave, gave the freedom for the gospel to go all over the world. I think that's, that's why I see how significant is the first council. And I can appreciate how difficult it could have been for what it was probably for the first Jewish disciples to battle this question, what to do with all the Gentiles who come to face in, in their Jewish Messiah and um, what great grace it took for them to understand uh, the Holy Spirit and the will of the Lord and uh, the amazing result that basically the whole continent of Europe began to, or at the time it was the Roman Empire, um, was a huge outpouring of evangelism that it was released by this first act of, of, of grace. There was this openness to the Holy Spirit's leading. And they said, this is what we feel is the right decision, but we wanna walk this out in fellowship. We're meant to be connected. And so let's keep coming back to one another. And as issues come up, let's seek the Holy Spirit. Let's seek one another's counsel. Let's see what God's saying. And so I think it's a model for us today. The Gentile church is split thousands of ways, but there was this great openness in, the, in these leaders of the first community of believers to say, let's seek the Lord together and be open to what he might be saying, because this was a surprise to them, but they were open to it. And so I think we should, we can all learn from that, that God still wants to surprise us. He wants us to seek out new revelation, but he wants us to do it in partnership with one another in unity with one another, with him. Why this decision was so important? I believe it widens 
our understanding of how God sees unity. Because for God, unity is unity in diversity, not uniformity. So if we want to be one, it doesn't mean that you, not, you must become the same like I am, which is usually our understanding. If you are with me, you must become like me. Later, when Paul was discovering more and more this mystery of God's will, he writes an amazing chapter in Romans 11. When he is describing wild olive tree and natural olive tree, and I don't know if you are gardening, but if you have in your garden an apple tree which is bearing green apples and the apple tree which is bringing forth red apples and you take a branch from the red apple tree and put in the green apple tree, which kind of color will, will this branch bear, uh, bear fruit? And it will bear fruit from the original apple tree. So on the green apple tree you will have one branch with, uh, with red apples. This is absolutely amazing because it, it uh, really shows us and celebrates that God really created all the nations, that He is a Father of all creation and He celebrates diversity. And you can stay who you are, we can celebrate that you are American and that you are German and that you are African and whatever you are and we can celebrate your uniqueness who you are and you can stay who you are and not trying to be, become somebody else. The original Jerusalem Council decision affirmed the unity and the diversity of the people of God, of, the, of God's desire that there would be Jews and Gentiles, that they were to relate to one another in this, this wonderful interdependence and mutual blessing and, and in a way that was humble and that respected each other's callings each other's unique personal callings and ethnic differences, etc. This is why we can be believers, Gentiles. I mean, the result of that decision of the First Council is, you know, we are walking proofs that nations of the world could come and receive the message uh, of salvation in Jesus or in Yeshua through that decision. Even today, that's why there is a Gentile church, because these Jewish apostles or disciples of, of the Lord decided to uh, open the gates uh, to the Gentile world. An important significance of the Jerusalem Council decision is that Jewish followers of Yeshua are called to continue to be Jews. They're called to continue to live out their lifestyle as Jews, to live out their covenant responsibilities as Jews, and to walk in the footsteps of Yeshua and the first Jewish uh, disciples of Yeshua who continued to live as Jews. And that is so, so important because when we look at later church history, all of this, get, all of this diversity that the Jerusalem Council uh, welcomed and, and embraced and affirmed and encouraged, all of that gets leveled down.